In this review of the week's news, a gun store owners in the firing line after an illegal gun sale, an entertainment icon's diagnosed with cancer, and Canterbury celebrate the first ever National Sausage Day. This is CTV News Week in Review. I'm Jared McCulloch. It was confirmed this week that entertainment icon John Gadsby has been diagnosed with cancer. Chelsea Daniels has more. Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what it looks like. Could be upside down for all I know. <laughs> for sake. Entertainer John Gadsby's family released a statement late this afternoon confirming Gadsby has cancer. His family said it was a difficult time and they would not be releasing any details of his condition. Gadsby is one of New Zealand's best-known comedians, shooting to stardom in the late 1970s with the TV show A Week Of It, followed by McPhail and Gadsby and Letter From Blanche in the 80s and 90s. Mike O'Connor first worked with Gadsby in 1978, then over a decade later they met again on the set of Letters To Blanche. I shot the, um, the two entire series, the last two series of the show that John um, and Dave McPhail did as actors and John co-wrote it and Dave McPhail and Alan Grant, A.K. Grant, um, called Letter to Blanche. Both series were about 12 episodes each shot over two years. And O'Connor says that working on the show is definitely a career highlight. In terms of comedy, I've never worked on, I have worked on other comedy shows, not a lot of them, but that most certainly is the best one I've ever worked on. And in terms of, and not only, and not only was it enjoyable, but it was also well liked by the audience. The last time O'Connor saw Gadsby was a couple of years ago while filming in South Canterbury. He was a lovely guy, John, very gentle guy and just a quiet, a quiet sense of humour on the personal, in the, as, uh, you know, in real life. But, um, you know, and he played that sort of... He always played the foil to, um, to uh, Dave McPhail's character, the two of them. And they were always dreaming up hairbrain screen, sk schemes in, in Lester Blanche. Gadsby also appeared in a number of feature films and is an accomplished writer, particularly in children's books. His family said today they were grateful for the excellent care he was receiving from the medical profession and for the good wishes and prayers from the community. Chelsea Daniels, CTV News. A Christchurch gun shop owner has found himself in the firing line after selling a gun online to an undercover journalist using a false name and gun licence, saying there's no loophole in the system. It was a story that frustrated gun city owner David Tipple. A journalist purchasing a rifle without a licence and with false details. I was absolutely incredulous that someone would be so silly as to break the law, as to forge the signature of a police uh, woman in order to uh, fake a mail order form. The news piece, which aired on TV3's current affairs show Story, highlighted a suspected loophole in the purchase of guns. But the store owner, who's based in Christchurch, says there isn't one. You know, this is the opportunity for a criminal to break the law. Uh, and in this case, uh, my lawyer tells me that there were five laws broken. And so what do we do now? Bring in another law? Will they stop at six? Is five their limit? Uh, if we have ten laws surrounding this, will that stop them? I don't think so. He blames the Privacy Act, saying it's hard to access information about people to double-check the information they're given. I can't ring up the police and say, please tell me what John Smith's firearms licence number is and I can't ring up and say tell me is this licence number the licence number of John Smith. We have been asking the police for some time to enable us to have access to licence numbers, validity and names and uh, they uh, we offered to to pay for the software that it would take to uh, to to have online access to that, and uh, that was in January. And they said they were working on it, and they'd get back to us within a few weeks. And they're having a meeting with us uh, early in November. Prosecution of the journalist could be stopped via a public interest clause. 
But Tipple thinks she should pay the consequences for breaking the law, three months in prison or a $1,000 fine. We have a really good record of very low firearms crime and it's continue, continuing to reduce. So where's the panic? Investigations into the illegal gun purchase are continuing. Jared McCulloch, CTV News. Half a decade since the big jolt, there's concerns around the number of people still stressed from the Christchurch quakes. Laura Twyman explains. This was bad enough. But now, five years on, the quakes are still felt in a very real way. The stress has been there and constantly there. Wendy Robinson has been waiting for a rebuild for five years. If I sit here and think about it too long, I will get angry, frustrated, yeah, those sort of things. So I basically don't think about it. And it's not just her. The Christchurch Community Response Team are a group of volunteers connected through local churches. They've been out door knocking since the quakes and are finding stress levels are through the roof right across the city. A lot of people are under a lot of stress. Um, a lot of people are still waiting for their repairs to be done or they've had their repairs done but they've not been fixed properly and don't know what to do. They've just finished in the wider Belfast area reporting their findings to the local community board. They found quite a few issues there, um, which was interesting to hear. From the houses they visited, the response team need to follow up with 60 people, something they're concerned about. People aren't aware of who they can contact to get help. The community board back their mission of directing people to the right channels. And so that's where we come in as well. We can give them people to to talk to and, and to be able to help them to get it all sorted. But the board are also encouraging Cantabrians to be optimistic. Look out for sites like this and see the hope in it. I think you can look at the numbers in a positive light and not look at them in a negative light. And I think as, uh, as a city, um, we need to start focusing on the positive. Even those still caught in the nightmare of waiting find that can help. Every time I go past a house that is being rebuilt or fixed, I say, thank you God, something's happening. Laura Twyman, CTV News. Well, still to come, a man pushes for change on one-way streets. Welcome back, a local man's rallying for changes to signs on one-way streets after the loss of a friend in a fatal car accident two weeks ago. His campaigns attracted a public following and the support of city councillors, but some experts wonder whether the problem needs a costly solution. Realising you've turned the wrong way on a one-way street is hard enough by day, but even harder at night. As these crash pictures show, a wrong turn had tragic consequences recently, here on the corner of Salisbury and Durham Streets. Friends of mine, Michael and Tony, were the ones in the accident on the 3rd of October on this intersection. Um, unfortunately, Michael passed away and talking to the families and even the police, they believe it was a good idea to start a campaign about this. The occupant of the car that hit John's friends also died. And while the crash is still being investigated, John's calling for flashing warning signs for drivers heading the wrong way on a one way. I, I believe it would alert drivers a lot faster and hopefully avoid anything like this happening. His online petitions attracted over 1,100 supporters. It's even caught the eye of a city councillor. We've got an opportunity as these streets are being redesigned, or whether it's one ways to two ways, or one ways staying as they are, but enhancements being made, we have a, the most cost effective time is to actually do it as we do those upgrades. So it makes sense to do it now. Because the one way sign I was going to John's about costed it. flashing warning signs through a national road sign supplier at ten thousand dollars each. To me, no life deserves a cost to put on it. But would warning signs really be the right way to go? National crash analysis figures show less than 1% of Christchurch car accidents are caused by drivers going the wrong way down one-way streets. Just 20 out of 11,000 car crashes since 2010. A roading expert doesn't think the cost adds up to roll out the idea citywide. If there was a particular issue though, say at one or two locations, it could be an option to, um, to put some kind of warning at those sites. 
Regardless, John is pursuing his campaign, desperate to stop anyone else suffering the loss he's going through. Cass Merritt, CTV News. A major funding push is needed to see the iconic Littleton Timeball station rebuilt, with Heritage New Zealand asking the community board to help with the shortfall. It was a Littleton landmark, standing for more than a century, until the jolt in June 2011 which brought it to its knees. But now, with over $2.5 million raised, the Timeball station is close to rising again. Heritage New Zealand is preparing the last major funding campaign to bring the country's only time ball back to its original home. And we wish them well and we will support them as far as we can. I mean, you know, uh, with what, what money we do have available and with letters of support and things like that. And, and I know that the Littleton people, who are always generous, um, will, will stump up with some cash, I'm sure. Built in 1876, the station provided ships at the harbour with a timekeeping service, but it suffered severe damage in both the 2010 and and 2011 earthquakes, with the historic building collapsing in on itself, only some could be saved. However, for the last two years, efforts have been underway to bring the Time Ball station back, nearly close to $3.5 million to rebuild. The local community board could expect a call for help to support the rebuild. Uh, we have a, a certain allocation, it's like 30 or 40,000 each year to, um, to, for strengthening communities funding for uh, community groups in our part of Christchurch City and we also have a little bit of additional discretionary funding. Um, I'm sure we'd be happy to give some of that but you know it would only be of an order of a couple of thousand probably that, we, that the community board could contribute. Funding is two thirds of the way through, now $800,000 is what's needed to bring the time back. You know, it was greatly missed after it came down after the earthquake, and it still is. You know, it's visible from all around the harbour, um, from all the communities around the harbour, and it was a real landmark. Of course people supported it, but, um, you know, uh, to what extent they can contribute financially, that remains to be seen. Heritage New Zealand wouldn't comment on what the campaign would entail, but says locals will know by early next week. Jared McCulloch, CTV News. The new New World supermarket opened in Redcliffs this week after a four and a half year wait. Chelsea Daniels reports. It's been nearly five years since the Redcliffs New World was destroyed by the quakes, but now locals have somewhere nearby to do their groceries again. It's fantastic. We've been waiting a long time. Four years. Four years. We'd moved in three weeks before the February earthquake, thinking, wow, we've got a supermarket on the end of our street. We had it for three weeks. Owner Julia Spence says locals are thrilled about the new supermarket opening today. Yeah, we've had a lot of locals uh, tell us, uh, the local community, that they're really looking forward to the store coming back. Um, so I, I think there, there has been out here for the, for the, um, for the local community wanting um, somewhere they can pop down to. She hopes this is the start of something bigger to come for the community. I think it can only be a positive thing for the, for the community um, that we're here, but I know that you know, we're sort of in a wee hub here with a jeweller and chemist and cafe, cafe and clothing shop across the road. So I think um, yeah, it'd be nice to see a few more. The new store has employed 102 staff, most of them new. Years in the making, the supermarket was a generally smooth process to get on its feet. To be honest, it's, it, uh, there were a lot of challenges early on with consenting issues and traffic light issues. But um, to be honest, from my point of view, it's all been pretty, pretty smooth sailing. I've been very fortunate. Um, foodstuffs, have, this is where the fourth store, uh, that they've reopened in about three months. So by the time everyone got to me, they um, knew exactly what they were doing and it really was actually just a really enjoyable process. And the locals couldn't be happier about the shorter journey for some bread and milk. It's great. Yeah, it's really good to have a local, a local supermarket open again. I just live up the hill, so it's on the way home and, yeah, fabulous. It's convenient. It's so much easier. We don't have to cross the causeway now. I can have CFDs, causeway free days. Radcliffe's New World opened this morning to a busy start with customers flying through the doors. Chelsea Daniels, CTV News. A local resident's had enough about the lack of parking in Rickerton. Here's Jussie Daniels. Problems with parking in the streets near Westfield Rickerton is an issue again. This time the blame is population growth in the area. The proposal to bring in ankle parking on Elizabeth Street to try and curb the parking woes will be brought up in tomorrow's Rickerton-Wigram Community Board hearing. This is the first 
issue that we've faced where it's resident parking rather than uh, employees parking. This area has been known for having difficulties with parking because of the mall employees parking in residential areas. Now this is different. This is now the intensification of this area. In the past, difficulties on Elizabeth Street were caused by employees from Westfield Rickerton and other businesses parking on the street all day. Two hour parking restrictions were then put in place. We've actually got the issue of how do we solve this, this particular one, and the resident has suggested angle parking. So she's coming to the community board tomorrow and we'll be asking staff to do a report on angle parking and any other options they see for solving this particular problem. Due to population increase, Broden says more parking is needed on the street for residents. This is now the intensification of this area and if you look across there and across there, there's new units, three or four together, and some of them have three or four people in them. So I'm, I understand from the resident who's called me down here that all this parking is resident parking. Broden will need the support of the board to get through her notice of motion, which she will know more about tomorrow. We did go down angle parking or some other solution. Everyone would be consulted. So council wouldn't just take the concerns of one resident. They would then do a leaflet drop across this whole area. She says if the staff decided to investigate, we should see angle parking in Elizabeth Street, Rickerton, in about four to five months. Chelsea Daniels, CTV News. Well, still to come, a local butchery takes out numerous awards for a barbecue favourite. Welcome back. Construction of four inner city navigation towers were underway this week, with the structures designed to help make life easier for locals and tourists to find their way around the central city. It's one of four navigation towers taking shape in the central city as part of the Christchurch City Council Transitional City Program. The eight metre high towers were designed to help both locals and tourists to find their way around central Christchurch. One of the signs already been completed on Cashel Street with the start of concrete foundations going down outside the bus interchange. Yeah, I think they're great because actually quite often I see on a daily basis tourists walking around struggling to find where they're going. Obviously there's not the landmarks that there used to be, a lot of buildings have been knocked down and at the moment all they seem to have is those uh, simple pamphlets. Well, it's pretty hard to know what's actually going on anywhere at the moment so if it's actually got places that are open that people can go to I think it's a good idea. I think a lot of people haven't even ventured back to the um, CBD so anything that can get people to come back and have a poke around is good. The towers were designed with businesses and tourism groups in mind to improve visitor experience in the city and visitors we spoke to gave the colourful signs the tick of approval. Anything that's a, you know, set out as a thing on the map to get around the city, that's a good idea. We've had two groups of tourists already this morning ask, ask us where the restart mall is. And, um, no, they're a good idea. We just need something to make it easier to get around the city, I believe. Do you think this gets a tick of approval? Yes. Yes. But some people didn't take any notice of the tower. No, I've got some, a logo here with me. So. All four of the wayfinding towers are said to be up by the end of the week. Jared McCulloch, CTV News. A local harness driver is lucky to be alive after a shock accident this week. Three wide, free falling. Oh, Emmanuel crashed to the track, turning in. Stony year and Gabby's uh, star went over the top, so too Maximus Prime. Nasty fall. Harness driver Sam Otley has escaped serious injury after a crash at Methven at the weekend. Otley was released from hospital late last night and she says she's on the mend. Yeah, I'm all right. I'm pretty sore, but um, yeah, it could have, probably could have been worse, so I'm pretty lucky, I think. And she says things could have gotten a lot worse. I got a... Uh, my lower back was really sore. I got a, um, a chip fracture in, my, in a vertebrae, my lower back. The injury will put the young driver out of action for six to 12 weeks. Hopefully not, hopefully, you know, I want to be back as soon as I can, but you just, yeah, you just got to play it by ear. The accident was unavoidable, with her horse Maximus Prime having no time to react, smashing into the fallen runners in front of them at high speed. It's just one of those freak accidents that, you know, you just you never think would happen, like, you know, the 
the horse in front just sort of its legs slipped, its legs come from from under it, turning for home, and um, yeah, the one, the last one's behind it just, just couldn't miss it. And she says it was only the drivers that caught the brunt of the crash. All horses are all right. They were, they were fine. There's no, nothing wrong with them at all. There's the people that have got bit better and bruised. Chelsea Daniels, CTV News. The Christchurch Big Band Festival has begun with some exciting events happening all over the city. It's Chelsea Daniels. The Christchurch Big Band Festival is back for another year and it's bigger than ever. We've got a great lineup of bands from all around New Zealand, Wellington, Dunedin, Nelson. Um, playing and uh, actually about 17 bands in 10 venues so it's a lot to look forward to over the weekend. And Belle says it's a very unique festival. Well it's the only festival of its kind in New Zealand. There's a lot of jazz festivals but no dedicated big band festivals. So it's a chance for big bands um, of all ages, like young ones like this one about to start, uh, through to very mature professional bands to get together, um, rub shoulders, and listen to each other, workshops, special guests come, you know, it's a very important for the genre. The festival was once held in the city's town hall, but after the earthquakes, they've had to make do with what they've got. Well, it was nice having a set venue where everything could pivot out of. It meant you could have stalls and things like that, a central point. Um, and maybe we will. I mean, that's the thing about living in Christchurch. Every year we reevaluate and think, what's going to work this year? It's been an annual event in Christchurch since 2007, organised and run by a committee of volunteers from local big bands and groups. It has adapted over the years, especially since the earthquake, and it's changed its focus into it's being instead of one central point, but being in amongst Christchurch and, and exciting new pop-up venues. The festival costs around $30,000 to set up, and Bell said they need all the help they can get to cover the costs. At every venue there'll be people taking donations, just so it does cost so much, and um, we really appreciate people's support in that way. There are free events all over the city all weekend, with the festival ending on Monday. Chelsea Daniels, CTV News. Well, finally tonight, it seems like there's a day for everything. And this week, many celebrated the first ever National Sausage Day. So what really makes a good sausage? Ah, the sausage, the ideal barbecue meat. But now it's being celebrated like never before with its very own National Day. And alongside it was the Dev Row New Zealand Sausage Competition, where one Christchurch butchery took out a whopping eight awards. The Edgeware-based butchery are over the moon. Absolutely stoked. Yeah, everyone, all the boys in here stoked. Yeah, no, a lot of hard work goes in behind it, so happy as Larry. The sausage is becoming more and more popular as years go by, with this butchery selling up to 12 different flavours, making them a prime product. There's more varieties now in, in New Zealand. You used to have your just standard beef and standard pork. Now you've got um, all the continental side coming through. Uh, you've got the like, German bratwurst. You've got the Dutch as well coming through. The top prize was awarded to Countdown Supermarket for their Alpine pork sausage, but the butchery is ready for the challenge. We sort of have to do what, what the big guys are not doing, because we, we can't compete with the big guys. We have to do something different. We've got to pride ourselves on small batch numbers um, and just service, um, things that the big boys are not doing. He says the history of the kiwi sausage has come a long way, with more time being spent on making it the best product. They originally go for them, they used to, because they were cheaper. But I think now they go for them because there's more variety, there's flavour, and um, they actually sausages now. They used to be, you know, you put in what was left over, but now it's actually you're putting in good cuts, like good lean pork shoulder, uh, gluten free, um, preservative free, MSG free, you know, things like that that people are looking for now. But for now, they want to celebrate their success and hope to do it all again next year and show what Christchurch has to offer. We've got a few more recipes up our sleeve, so yeah, we'll, we'll do our best to maybe next time um, have a few more there, you know. So <laughs> yeah, no, it'd be great. Jared McCulloch, CTV News. And that is CTV News Week in Review. I'm Jared McCulloch. Have a safe Labor weekend. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.